Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to introduce Karen Chan, the Group Chief Commercial Officer for Air Asia, who will talk to us uh, about that uh, airline's uh, plans. Thank you, Karen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karen, Group Chief Commercial Officer for Air Asia. First of all, thank you, Henry, for the introduction, and thank you to Aviation Festival for inviting me to share the story of Air Asia, how we recover, how resilient we were, how we survived COVID, and now we are refocusing on growth. I see that there's a lot of people here, <laughs> and 99% of them are actually from Air Asia, so no questions. For those who may not know and may not be too familiar with Air Asia, allow me two minutes to introduce Air Asia. We are 23 years young. Compared to a lot of European carriers that's over 100, we haven't really hit our prime yet. So that's why we are focusing on growth. We started in 2001 with our two co-founders, Tanshri Tony Fernandez and Dato Kamarudin, purchasing two Boeings at the price of one ringgit. Now we have to over 200 operating aircraft, 400 plus on order book, and we now have seven AOCs in Malaysia, in Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, with our latest addition in Cambodia, Air Asia Cambodia. We'll be inaugurating our flight in Q2. We also have close to 25,000 personnel, which we call All-Stars, and I'll share a little bit more about our culture later. I love this photo not because our CEO, Tony Fernandez, have lost another 12 kilos from this photo that was taken last year, but this really epitomizes who we are. It's the 14th time that we have actually won the Skytrax low-cost carrier, best world low-cost carrier award. And what you can see in this photo, thank you. What you can see in this photo is that we all having fun doing something that we love. And Air Asia is the largest ASEAN carrier by PAX flown. Over the past 23 years, we have already carried over 800 million passengers. We now have 200 plus aircraft operating, flying to over 130 destinations across 19 hubs. If you look at just low-cost carrier in ASEAN, we are number one. We have close to 25% of market share. We are number one in Malaysia and Thailand for the, both domestic and international. We are number one in Indonesia for international travel, but number three across the whole uh, Indo uh, Indonesia, including domestic. And we are number three in Philippines. So we were flying pretty high until COVID hits and the entire travel industry came to a grounding halt, and we were not spared. What did we have to do in order to survive? We have to go and impose some pretty drastic measures in cost control, which means, unfortunately, we have to furlough and retrench about 25% of our staff. We also need to go and close down our operations in India and Japan, and we also need to restructure our long-haul business. Were they painful? Absolutely, yes but they were actually the right decisions in order for the business to survive. And again, I want to talk about culture later on in the other panels as well. Personal sacrifices were made in order for Air Asia to survive. But we didn't pause. We did not actually wait for the storm to pass, and then we actually start. In fact, we actually accelerated the diversification process because COVID taught us a very important lesson, the importance of diversification of the business as well as digitalization of our platforms. So what do we have to do to pivot and in order to survive? We have to go and use our existing assets. We have a very, very strong B2C platform. Since day one, we are a digital-first airline. When we were still dialing using our phone line into ADSL, we already started selling online booking. So we actually pivoted our platform, our online platform, to sell instead of just Air Asia flight. We also launched our food delivery business, our ride hail business. Why? because we need to go and provide alternative livelihood for the furlough and the retrenched staff. 
we want to keep as many as our employees with us as possible. Hence, a lot of our ground handling staff, our cabin crew, even our pilots became drivers during those past three years. In 2020, we also launched Air Asia Digital Engineering. We always have our own in-house engineering, but we realized that MRO is a business that we would be able to go and provide our expertise to third-party carriers as well. So we launched that during COVID. At the same time for the airline, we didn't just wait, sit back and wait. We continued to go and mount evacuation flights across ASEAN. We supply a lot of medical supplies to China, to Wuhan, as well as to other ASEAN countries. We have no choice. We have to go and convert some of our commercial planes into cargo planes. And we also establish Air Asia Academy. You can imagine a lot of our frontliners, our RAM staff, our engineers, they may not actually have the skill set to write a CV. So we started our Air Asia Academy, have multiple various courses from how do you go and write a CV to programming to how to go and do digital marketing. We try to reskill, upskill our staff during those difficult times. And for those who have actually flown with us, Santan is basically our in flight catering. And yes, we actually brought airline food onto ground. We actually opened 15 restaurants during that time. Most of them were franchised by our pilots, by some of our staff as well. Again, it's about looking after our staff during those difficult times with alternative livelihood. And as a result of all this, post-COVID, Tony actually announced Capital A. We formed Capital A, which is really the infesco of this beautiful ecosystem that was born out of COVID. A synergistic portfolio of the companies with Aviation Group, our seven AOCs still being the core, but now being supported by complementary services across four verticals. We now have aviation services. I mentioned about engineering, our in-flight catering, GTR being our ground handling, and DARTS, which is basically back-end shared services. Logistics, Teleport. Teleport was founded in 2018, <laughs> before COVID. Now, instead of just basically selling the belly space of our commercial flight, they have just got their delivery of the third charter, another A320, fulfilling both the first and the last mile. We've also developed a full-fledged digital ecosystem. We used to call it Air Asia Super App. Now we call it Air Asia Move. Having the online platform, the fintech, the payment wallet, the big pay, as well as our loyalty points, Air Asia Rewards. And another new uh, development that we have is Capital A International, holding our IP, our brand. So what does that take us to? As I shared already, Air Asia is already the largest ASEAN carrier. How do we bring the world closer to ASEAN? And how can we actually bring ASEAN closer to the world? For full year 2023, we have already recovered our capacity up to 75%. We anticipate by end of this year, we would be 100% recovery. And we'll be carrying hopefully about 85 million passengers this year. There's a lot of headwinds that the travel industry is facing. How can we continue to uphold the motto that we have? Now everyone can fly, democratizing travel so that we can still have affordable travel, taking customers to new destination and being efficient in the way we use our fleet. We have five strategic pillars that underpin our growth. The first is about reactivating 100% of our fleet. We need to fly all our planes again. And we need to be absolutely intentional in pairing the right fleet type with the characteristics of the route. Let me give you an example. Post-COVID, a lot of the popular routes are also the most congested airports in the world. Take for instance, Hong Kong, Changi, Narita. We may not be able to get any new slots. So we need to go and ensure that we upgauge our narrow body into our more efficient fleet, the three two ones, and then our wide body, in order to tap into the growing demand. 
At the same time, for some routes whereby pre-COVID, it used to be very much group booking based, but as a result of the pandemic, it's now switched to more individual FIT travel, we will now be down gauging to narrow body. So we need to be very intentional in the pairing of the right fleet with the right routes. Secondly, we continue to go and modernize our fleet. Air Asia is the first to actually receive and fly A321 NEOs in 2021 with Malaysia Air Asia and Thai Air Asia. What does that mean? We are able to go and save 660 liters of fuel per turn, which means that our carbon intensity is dropped by 20%. Air Asia has been awarded multiple times in terms of our sustainability efforts, and we continue to go and push the envelope in terms of being the most efficient uh, airline in the world. The third pillar is about organic growth. How do we continue to deepen and diversify our network beyond ASEAN? As you may have heard, we are actually opening our first inaugural flight to Kazakhstan in Almaty in Central Asia. This is our first foray into a very underserved but absolutely stunning country. And we expect that we will continue to go and grow CIS region. And for those who actually want to go and do skiing, other than Niseko Sapporo, try Shimbulak in Amati, half the price and double the fun. India, we are also doubling down. We will be opening double digit new routes in India as we actually see the growth of both inbound and outbound traffic in India. And we have already started flying to Jeddah, and this will also be our first expansion into the rest of Middle East. The fourth pillar is about organic growth again. We will continue to pursue our multi-hub strategy. Air Asia is one of the few airlines whereby we actually practice multi-hub. What do we mean? We don't just have our main hub in KL. We have our hub in KL, in Bangkok, in Manila, in Jakarta, and very soon in Phnom Penh. Because the proximity of this ge geography will allow us to go and reach other parts of the world in different ways. This geographic advantage by having multi-hub is something that is very unique to Air Asia. We have already announced the launching of Air Asia Cambodia, and our first inaugural flight will be in Q2. And finally, inorganic growth. Air Asia can't do everything by our own. So we are very happy to be able to work with strategic partners to allow us to go and expand the traffic catchment. We already have Air Asia Indonesia, but we do not serve the fourth and the fifth city, tier cities, or smaller islands, which Garuda would serve. So hence, not only are we able to allow to bring Indonesian passengers to go and come into our network, Vice versa, we are able to go and support Garuda to go and expand into the rest of ASEAN whereby they are currently not flying via interlining, via code sharing. And of course, as an airline, we expect both tailwinds and headwinds, and there's quite a lot. But as I just mentioned, we already have ways of mitigating it by continuing to become the most efficient airline. What is actually headwinds that we are facing, and a lot of them are macro and not controllable by ourselves. We are seeing a historic low of our currency for ringgit. Anyone who is Singaporean here, I think you know what we are talking about. It's cheaper for you to fly to Penang to have chicken rice and a side of durian than going to Clark Key to have a nasi lemak. So it's both both a challenge as well as an opportunity for us to go and attract more inbound tourists into Malaysia. As a result of geopolitical tension, we continue to go and see volatility in fuel price, as well as also the disruption of supply chain, which as a result also impact the return of fleet. And finally, as I shared, we need to go and mitigate the growing congested airports in ASEAN, and hence we need to go and have flexibility in our fleet. I only have about 30 seconds left, but I just want to say thank you very much. Air Asia is on the cusp of being amazing again for 2024. We have survived COVID and now we'll become stronger and better. Thank you very much. Thank you.